Mr. Chancellor, Her Excellency Sharon Johnston has lived a life of exuberant reinvention as rehabilitation scientist, entrepreneur, novelist, and healthcare activist. No sooner did her circumstances of life change than she adapted. Her challenges were opportunities in disguise. Her Excellency remembers her early days on Summit Avenue in Sault Ste. Marie, where she learned lessons of steadfast resilience from her mother and grandmother and of community spirit from a welcoming neighborhood that embraced them. At the University of Toronto, she studied physical and occupational therapy and embarked on a first career as an occupational therapist in the area of child psychiatry. She later com completed a MSc and a PhD in rehabilitation science at McGill University. Her master's research aimed at an understanding of how physiotherapy can assist the obstructed breathing of patients with diseases such as cystic fibrosis. Her doctoral thesis continued her work on respiratory mechanics under the celebrated professor of medicine, Dr. Peter Macklem. Scholarly publications resulted. In The Scientist, there was also an athlete and an artist. A fitness regime and an emphasis on wellness, she explains, originally came from necessity. At the age of 34, she had five daughters of less than seven years of age. She found her artistry in creative writing and a novel that brought Western Canada in the early 20th century to life. The scientist remained, and so too the capacity for renewal and reinvention. Her Excellency applied her skills at rehabilitation to animals in managing a successful horse boarding and dressage business after the Johnstons returned to Southern Ontario. At Rideau Hall, Her Excellency has been characteristically warm, caring, energetic, and down to earth. It is very easy to get beyond what she calls her snazzy title. When she and her husband decided to put a spotlight on mental health, she immediately came to the conclusion that she would have to know and comprehend the subject as a scientist would. She has promoted fresh approaches to mental health interventions, treatments, and diagnostics, supported by caring professionals, volunteers, and families. The Sharon Johnston Champion of Mental Health Award for Youth is named in her honor. Mr. Chancellor, in recognition of her career in rehabilitation science, her work in the field of child psychiatry, and as a Canadian author, all while serving Canada, especially at Rideau Hall, I request that you confer the degree of Doctor of Laws honoris causa on Her Excellency Sharon Johnston. Quite. Second. By, uh, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Senate and the Board of Governors, it is my privilege to bestow upon you the degree of Doctor of Laws honoris causa with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities thereto pertaining. Welcome to our graduating class. Hello, and you can misbehave. <laughs> I raised a lot of kids, don't be polite. Um, the one thing I wanted to say to all of you young people, I did have five children in seven years, I don't recommend fast track reproduction. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Vice Chancellor, Chair of the Board, graduates, distingue andite, and our elder here who has given a prayer, Elder Thomas. Thank you for honoring me with the doctorate. This is a profound moment indeed. So Dr. Kelkishos Kimonor. 
Let me be begin by acknowledging that we are located on the traditional territory of the Algonquin Nation, a fitting place to reflect on the Truth and Reconciliation Report that was released to all Canadians last year. It's a report that reveals, through personal testimony, the impact and failure of the government's assimilation policy that resulted in a residential school system. Many of you will already be familiar with this dark chapter in our history. However, one of the many findings to emerge from the report was that far too few Canadians know the history of residential schools, the history of the treaties, and the contributions of Aboriginal peoples have made to the building of our country. The early European explorers to our country would not have survived without the knowledge, wisdom, and generosity of our First Nations. My own curiosity to understand the residential school system arose when I began the research for my next book that is part of a trilogy. Writing like science requires research. While reviewing government records, Privy Council documents, and personal correspondence with regard to the Shinwalk Indian Residential School in Sault Ste. Marie, I discovered facts that were hard to comprehend. The Sioux is where the Governor General and I grew up. I read that tuberculosis was a frequent cause of death in residential schools, yet TB testing was not done on Indian children. Sanatoriums in Southern Ontario refused to treat residential kids. Raw sewage was dumped into St. Mary's River, that's where Sault Ste. Marie runs along, where the children swam. And faulty electric wiring and no fire escapes risked the children being trapped if a fire broke out. In 1930, long before you were born, the building was condemned, but it would take another six years before a new school was built. The Indian Act stated that all Indian children must attend school. They did not say it had to be a good one. The documents, records, and letters from the Officer of Public Health revealed a lack of concern for our first people that was shocking. Most unsettling during my research was the discovery that my own grandmother had been the nurse matron at the Shinwalk. I adored her. It took me days to digest that information. My grandmother believed in education and actually contributed to the building of a new school that is now Algoma University. She would not have understood the harm of the assimilation policy. Her granddaughter does. David and I are both honorary witnesses to the truth and reconciliation process. The words residential school have left a bad taste in our mouths. The word assimilation is anathema to Canadian society that just welcomed thousands of Syrian refugees, respectful of their cultural practices. The report card of a Shinwalk pupil recorded she still speaks her own language, Cree in this instance, no doubt that warranted punishment, at least a verbal reprimand. Imagine if you were punished for speaking Mandarin, Hindi, Urdu, Japanese, or any other language spoken by your family. Let me read you a powerful poem written by Rita Jo, a Mi'kmaq elder and poet, about the importance of talking and listening and sharing and dreaming together. It's called, I Lost My Talk, and it goes like this. I lost my talk, the talk you took away when I was a little girl at Chubinakadi School. You snatched it away. I speak like you, I think like you, I create like you, the scrambled ballad about my world. Two ways I talk, both ways I say, your way is more powerful. So gently I offer my hand and ask, let me find my talk so I can teach you about me. I think Rita Jo would be proud to see all of you here today listening to her simple yet profound poem. J'espère que tous les Canadiens apprendront à se respecter les uns les autres et reconnaîtront l'importance du patrimoine et de l'histoire octotone. Notre histoire en est une de diversité. Let me ask you, as I close these short remarks, 
to be your own witness to the contribution of the First People to our land. We would not be where we are today without them. Thank you.